I had that piano uh, sonata to play as a ninth grader, or recital, so it's a pretty challenging piece of music. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for the introduction. My daughter, who's now 33, when she was six, I asked, made a mistake of asking her how she thought I should be introduced, and her comment was, just tell me you're an idiot. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure yet that opinion's changed much, but I'm also a fast-talking Southerner. When I grew up in eastern North Carolina, fast-talking Southerners were either con men uh, or uh, horse thieves. So uh, I hope I'm neither one of those, but I'm going to try to cover a very complex topic and approach autism through the back door. I'm going to look at it in terms of what other developmental disorders are a part of that differential diagnosis. How do you distinguish autism from other things? And I think that's perhaps the easiest way to start because uh, he pretty much covered it. Uh, I think the two things that are uh, most prominent now in our new classification system, the DSM-5, which is what psychiatry psychiatry uses to make diagnoses, focus on social communication, which is a large group of collection of symptoms, and uh, repetitive and restrictive behaviors, interests, and cognitions, which is another large group. And so these two encompass most of autism. Uh, and so this is what we're going to try to kind of work our way toward if I don't mess up the computer. Which and these are basic goals, I, you guys can look at those, but I think one thing is what about classroom teachers? Because my wife's a preschool teacher, and she's had several young children in her class that probably were in the autistic spectrum uh, that, were never that weren't diagnosed at the time. And so they really, she came across it firsthand. Uh, most of the people I see have been referred, uh, I'm sort of the last uh, person in a row of referrals to beyond me, I don't know who, where they go. Uh, but I want you to think of this brain we got. Costs us a lot of time, costs us a lot of energy. 20% of our calories go to feed this thing. And one of the fascinating things is, is people look at it as a machine, but it's probably much more like the Amazon than it is a machine. It's a constantly evolving, adapting organ. And what's always been fascinating to me is if we look at our picture of science fiction, most of the people like Spock and Data and the extraterrestrials are cold, impassionate, rational beings. And in some respects, this is what many people with high-functioning autism behave like. Uh, and it's fascinating, that's our wave of future, what we see as our future. Now, the other thing to think about is the brain is a developing organism, changes. Uh, you guys teach preschoolers, by the time these same kids are 21 or 22, their brain will have completely rewired itself. It won't get any larger. That 85 to 90 percent is pretty constant by age six. Now, people with autism at age two may start to show an acceleration in head growth that doesn't necessarily match increased intellectual ability. So we've got a closed space for this brain to develop in. And so what happens is nerve cells rewire themselves. The white matter connects all these things. So our intelligence that we develop over time is a very uh, progressive and epigenetic phenomenon. It builds on previous skills. And so one of the things that we've been trying to sort out with autism and autism spectrum, exactly where in this sequence does it occur? And what causes it? And there are probably as many reasons or causes as there might be people with autism. And this is just uh, kind of another way of sta stating the stuff in the previous slide. But this brain starts from one cell, and by 20 weeks of gestation, by about four, that's what, three months, four months, uh, there are probably 10 billion nerve cells. So things are going pretty on, happening pretty hap rapidly. And this may be one of the points in time that the brain, developing brain is most vulnerable to whatever causes autism. And it may turn out that there are multiple reasons for this disorder to develop and multiple autisms. Right. Now, the other thing is this brain develops the whole idea of increasing control, increasing capacity to adapt to novel situations, increasing capacity to communicate, increasing capacity to think creatively to solve problems creative, the interest in art and music uh, are areas that develop. And I can remember as a, a medical student not too many years ago that we were taught that after about 18 or 19 there's not much going on. But that was just totally wrong. To some few of us old timers, we're, we're laying down new brain cells and, and rewiring cells and making new connections, uh, which is the essence of learning. So every time you learn something, you've rewired your brain to some degree. Well, something in autism doesn't like that process. And, um, and the question is going to be what? 
Now, to think through autism as a developmental disorder, we gotta, I think, first begin to think about what areas does it seem to impact? And what are some of the attachment problems and how do they look like autism? How can they mimic what we see as autism? And one of the things that I was taught a thousand years ago was that bonding is critical, that if it doesn't happen quickly, it won't happen, and both those probably are wrong. Uh, we have a tremendous reserve and infants can adapt, but there seem to be some uh, problems that are not more difficult to overcome. And I think this is one of the reasons we've been working very closely. We're trying to recognize how early can we spot autism. And you can look at kids' first birthday parties. And what you'll notice in the films that have been made, uh, and it was a study doing this, that these kids don't respond to their name. They don't point to things and want somebody to engage with them. They seem to be preoccupied. They don't imitate other people very well. And this is at a year. Now, right now, there's a big research project going on through Autism Speaks that's looking at infants at, at three months of age. And it looks as if gaze preference to parents, to mothers over objects, uh, to uh, uh, focusing and sharing attention, and locking in to the human voice just doesn't seem to be going the way it should. And that's just one subgroup. Now, other people do seem to develop normally until about 18 to 24 months, and then something happens. And the question is what? And there can be infections. For a while, people thought it might be vaccinations, but that probably didn't turn out to be true. All the pertussis, whooping cough vaccines have been, has caused some neurological dysfunction in people, but they don't all look autistic. Uh, so we're looking at a very early pattern of communication. And we humans as a primate, we're social primates. And our first reaction is to lock in on a human face and lock in on a human voice. Well, parents who've had children with autism say this is one of the things they didn't, the rest of the severely impaired ones, they didn't see that. This child just didn't seem to acknowledge it or seem to be deaf or inconsistent. Or oftentimes too good a baby until about a year and then they started screaming and had a very difficult time processing sensory information. Anybody in here use baby talk when they give a, a lecture? Uh, you know, because most of us, if you sit down to a, a six-month-old, a 12-month-old and say, uh, you know, I, I think today is a, a bright, sunshiny day. The uh, ambient air temperature is at 67 degrees. Humidity is probably 48 percent. I don't think that baby's going to process a whole heck of a lot of that. And then you look at people when a baby walks in the room. And how many people look so stupid? <laughs> and you kind of, uh, what happened to those people? They used to be intelligent folks. But this is the power of seduction. And what we don't realize is when that infant is doing that, the areas in our brain that are called mirror neurons that are firing off, mimicking exactly what that baby's doing, and vice versa. And uh, years ago, there was a study looking at uh, babies at, at shortly after birth. And if you stick your tongue out of them and you hold it out, they'll do it too. But that'll disappear it's like a reflex. And then it'll come back again, which separates us from chimpanzees. Uh, but I think the key part of attachment is not that people with autism don't attach, it's that they may do it in very unusual fashion. They have very profound attachments to parents, to people, sometimes to pots and pans, sometimes to shoes, uh, but it's there. And the question is, can we recognize it for what it is? Because sometimes it's very disorganized. It's very, very difficult to figure out what it exactly is, but it's there. And the other thing on this list up here is called joint attention. And this is interesting. You want to pull a trick on joint attention. Walk outside in a crowd and point up at something. Just stand there. And watch how long it takes for people to start doing that. Well, a lot of people with autism wouldn't do that. They wouldn't fall for that trick. Uh, it's like a, a yawn. I don't know how infectious yawns are to some people, but somebody besides you yawn, you're going to start yawning. But they don't seem to do that very well either. So this joint attention, though, is going to be critical. Because this is how you pick up vocabulary words. You point at a truck, that's a truck. And you describe it. But if you don't look at that truck, and you don't follow your finger, and you don't seem to be interested in it, uh, you may not pick that vocabulary word up. So it may be critical for language. And I think the other thing that people with autism struggle with is, is social play. And I think this is a, probably uh, at, humans, at humankind, a, guy, a, a philosopher named Schilder once said, the humans are at their best when they're at play. And this seems to be an area that, that either doesn't progress, it's not creative, it's not in a social context, and it doesn't develop as well. 
It doesn't mean people don't play, but many times it's with parts of objects. This is severely dysfunctional folks. And at a higher functioning end of autism, uh, you may not realize it. I've had people I've spent an hour with and swore they were carrying on a conversation with me and realized that I've just heard the scripts from about five or six movies. That as long as I stay in the movie script line, I do okay. If I step outside it, then you watch the communication break off. It's, so it's not, in a sense, communicating. It's like echolalia, a delayed echolalia. Uh, and so all these are, are present. Now, when you see people with reactive attachment disorder, which is listed down here, what you're beginning to see are people that did not have a, a human contact or had one that was very disturbed or very aggressive or very inconsistent. And so they really don't attach. And about 50 years ago, a group of psychoanalysts were looking at Robertson's we're looking at this in, in very young children and noticed that there was, there seemed to be a, a, a point in time that if, if you're smiling as, as an infant and the person across from you is not responding, the so-called stone face or fixed face, that is very distressing to infants. And so they were, it, it was a whole distress protest movement that would emerge. They would try anything they could to get your attention. And then they would get kind of despondent. And the argument that they made in the uh, 40s was that, um, that led to detachment. And so you don't attach. You don't seem to be interested in people. And those of you familiar with reactive attachment disorder is a diagnosis, that's what it, as one subgroup of it, that you just don't seem to attach to anybody. And you don't do it well. And I think as humans we realize that something happens because most babies can elicit from even the worst parents at least something uh, and some kind of attachment. Well, the parent attaches to the infant, and when, it, when they don't, it's, they're in trouble. Because the infant requires that to survive. And then if you remember Harry Harlow, back in the, uh, also in the late 40s, he took macaques, uh, rhesus macaques, uh, monkeys, and exposed them to a feeding environment with a wire mesh mother. And he, he also exposed them to a cloth mother. Of course, neither one of them were mothers. But the infants, the babies did far better with the claw, and far better than just being fed. So what they noticed was there's something besides just being fed that's critical to organizing the brain and getting this process rolling into development. A synchrony of balance. Uh, uh, it's interesting, if I sat and videotaped you guys in very slow frames, and if I start moving like this, pretty soon you're moving with me. That sort of synchronicity and rhythmicity is there. And then reciprocity, the exchange of information. I exchange information, I'll wait for your answer. You see that in nine, 10 months old. They're doing it very proficiently at that point. Well, again, these are some areas that folks are interested in because something in autism, people may not spontaneously do that or as well as their siblings. And again, this is a, these are generalizations. And so we got this, whatever this is we call, we label autism is beginning to affect very early attachment behaviors. And it, 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 it's almost as if they're not processing what you're able to send. And or joint attention, you can train people to do that, but to do it spontaneously on your own and to bring something to somebody to show them that you're excited about and to share that with them is, is one of the things that seems to be missing in those kids in a year who have, uh, are at high risk for autism because they have a sibling with autism who went on to develop the disorder. So there's something very early. There's signals there, and the question is, what do they really mean? And then temperament. Uh, one of the interesting things in psychiatry is this whole concept is just not used. And temperament is how we behave, how we react to things. Uh, and there's really it's a lot of genetic markers for temperament now. And some of them are related to social anxiety. A guy named Jerome Kagan in the 70s at Harvard uh, he started looking at this behavioral inhibition, and he put infants in new situations. They withdrew. They seemed distressed. They seemed over-aroused autonomically. The whole nervous system responded to that novel thing as a stress. Well, if you follow these guys, and you don't help them adapt to that temperament, or you uh, force them. My daughter wants me to tell you a stupid story. I'll tell you. She'll kill me. She know I told you this, but when she was, she was a very slow to adapt child. Very, one of these little behaviorally inhibited children. And uh, what we noticed, we had a four-year birthday party. And everybody got together. My family getting them together is like you're herding cats. Um, and they always eat. 
Uh, so there's always plenty of food. But my daughter walked out and saw everybody holler surprise, and she went back in the room, closed the door, and started crying. And if I had gone in there and said, okay, kid, you're coming out, all these relatives have come here to see you, I would have had a war on my hands, because she was an incredibly stubborn person also. And, and so she was very socially anxious. By the time she was in the two-year, three-year play school we put her in, the teacher asked us one day, can Katie talk? She had not said a word in three months. I said, talk, she can read, she can, she can talk. She's just choosing not to do it. But she finally just backed off and didn't ask her anything, she finally started talking. And right now she's working on her doctorate, so but, uh, she's a, I was a very smart kid. Uh, but one of the things that we watch, and this, what some people think autism may tie into temperament, is an extreme form of that. That anything novel tends to trigger this reaction. And of course it can vary in intensity. And some people are uh, selectively mute who have this type of, who had this type of temperament, who have this kind of social anxiety. That's a big part of what we, if you looked at them, you swear they, they, they couldn't talk. That's what that's where my daughter was. But the other thing is neuroticism. That's not being neurotic in psychoanalytic sense. Okay. Probably like I get closer to the mic. Mike, can you take this thing out? No, you can't take it out. Okay, well, I'm used to walking around the stage. I'm just feel I'm, I'm trapped like a rat. Uh, but with uh, neuroticism, it's a negative reaction. It's not only something new that you have trouble with, it's an intense negative reaction. And it oftentimes associated with irritability. And uh, again, left unmodified by experience and by compensatory experiences, it can really pose some problems for some people. And then the other thing is how parents match up with their children. Because when Chess and Thomas looked at this in the 70s, that was what they saw as critical. If you help that child adapt to the, and these are not pathologic states, these are variations of normal, just like behavior inhibition is. If you work with those, uh, you can help a kid overcome them and develop. If you don't, if you challenge them, if you don't accept them uh, and try to force it otherwise, that's when you begin to see problems. And the kids that were difficult, just like the kids who had disorganized attachments, uh, were the ones that seemed to have more trouble. And this may be a part of the overall spectrum of autism. Because autism is a big bell-shaped curve. Maybe two or three little curves in it, but it's a dimensional disorder. That means there's no X marks the spot. We tend to diagnose it based on a number of symptoms, but that's probably not the best way to do it. We're going to have to find another way of doing it. And it's a risk factor. Uh, it's a risk factor for post-traumatic stress disorder. If you take everybody in this room who have gone through the same trauma, 10 to 15 percent of you would develop PTSD. And it looks like those that would have a, a genetic risk for it. And those that don't are more resilient. And again, it gets back to the same things that Kagan was talking about, that heart rate goes up, cortisol gets released, the stress response system kicks into high gear. That puts you, makes you more vulnerable. Uh, in fact, people now looking at the ER for people who've been traumatized, how to you treat that hypertension, the resting blood pressure, resting pulse are better predictors of PTSD than the actual thing that happened to them. And we see, we see this in autism all the time. And you measure cortisol, which is a stress hormone, in social interactions, and it goes up, stays up, doesn't go back down when the stress is over. So it's an aversive experience for some people. And maybe why fragile X is a syndrome where people don't establish eye contact, see direct gaze as a threat, uh, have trouble and get, often get labeled autistic when they may or may not be. Uh, but again, these are kind of uh, overall, for, and in language, most people, most families, when, the la when language doesn't develop, that's when they think autism. Now, there are people, especially Asperger's in the high end, high end of the spectrum, that may speak precociously, may have very extensive vocabularies, they read like the hyperlexic kids there. But if you watch them, they don't seem to comprehend quite what they're reading. In fact, there's a thing in, in I used to do a lot of work with uh, kids with traumatic brain injury and, and uh, neurosurgery uh, called cocktail party syndrome, where these kids come in with these extensive vocabularies and speaking in a very long sense. In fact, one of my favorite patients, his dad was a professor at Duke, and he would come in and Take his, he wore glasses, take his glasses off and talk like this. And, 
and move his hands like that. And his dad came in about 30 minutes later and did the exact same thing. And uh, this guy was really spouting off, and he asked him, what are you really talking about? He wasn't sure. The funny one was I have a, a guy who I was telling you that, that actually placed out a, a, all the calculus classes in, in, at North Carolina State University, which is our engineering school, uh, in the 10th grade in high school. They were running out of math to give it. And he would uh, do it, his, things in his head and write the answers down. And they thought he was cheating. They accused him of cheating. He proved he did. They gave him all these things, he answered it. He just saw the answer. We had to take a Shakespeare class. And I wrote the university dean. I said, this, this guy contributed to the Martian Lander. He did the mathematics for that. But uh, this guy's got to get out of school. He, you can't hold him back because of Shakespeare. She said, well, just, just be patient. Let's see what happens. We also have photographic memory. So he went in and read every critic of a comment on Shakespeare, committed it to memory. So they asked him a question. What is what light through yon window breaks? It is Juliet, she is the east. She is the sun. He, he could rattle off what, spout off what 10 or 12 world authorities on Shakespeare said about it. So he got an A. And you ask her, what do you think that means? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. She can't be the sun, she can't be the east, she can't be the light. I know that's what that guy says, but they don't, it's just a bunch of crap to me. And that was his comment, but he got A in the course, which goes to prove you can go into academics. You don't have to know anything as long as you can spout it out. But, uh, <laughs> man, he was good at it. He was just phenomenal. I mean, we, I spent sleepless nights over this one because it was really, really bothered me. But this joint attention is key to language. Language is a reciprocal uh, interaction. You start, I start. There are rules of engagement. There are rules of talking. There are rules of what you say, when you say it, the pragmatics of language when you say it. And there are also gestural communication. There's also affective tone called prosody to words. Well, all these things, most of us process all this at the same time. It's interconnected. But some people with autism don't do that. They can process either the information, like a computer, or they can process at least some of the affective information, but not combine them, and not do it instantaneously. And one of my other adult patients, I'm, I don't want to talk about adults too much, but I sat on an airplane flying back from, uh, I think it was from Detroit sometime, and this guy sat down beside me and started talking. And I'm sitting there looking out the window, and he, he chimes in and starts talking about he's a, a world authority on cockroach mouth parts. <laughs> and so he pulls out his pictures, and he just got back from South America or something. Oh, yeah, this is a part, this is, you tell this species, and you tell that species. And about middle way through it, he looked at me and said, oh, by the way, do you know I had Asperger syndrome? I kind of politely said, I, I, I thought so. But I, I wasn't going to say anything. This guy, I mean, this was phenomenal. His visual detail was just unbelievable. I was just like, it was like a cockroach to me. Uh, but the other thing with, with language is a part of play. It's part of our interaction. It's part of our species. That's uh, what the philosophers in the 18th century said, what made us human? The capacity to use language. Well, in many folks, autism it, it impacts language. It impacts the pragmatics when you say things, what the appropriateness are. I mean, you don't walk into a classroom and say, oh, well, that's the, that, that teacher is big, ugly, and fat. You know, I've had people do that. I had one guy, well, you know, he, he, he was so mad, I said, I'm going to put a bomb in this school. And of course, they called in the cops, the SWAT team, and everything else. And, and the poor guy didn't really understand what the implications of what he had said was. He wasn't a very violent, violent person. But he got picked on more than anything else. So these kind of things just don't seem to connect. So this is a disorder of connections. And our brain does this routinely. And as it matures, it gets easier and easier. But if I show you, as a study's done with functional MRIs, a fancy x-ray machine, an imaging machine, looking at an autistic child looking at a human face, and you and I looking at a human face, and us looking at a fire truck, and a kid with autism looking at a fire truck, kid with autism is more interested in the fire truck. An area in the brain that lights up when we look at human faces, lights up in the truck, not the face. Now what happens, you have to train that. One of the things we do with this brain as it develops is we train these things. Language in little people is scattered all over the brain. By the time you get your guys' age, it's pretty much in the left hemisphere, about 90% of us. So it's lateralized, and as it lateralizes, it gets more efficient. And that may not happen very well. 
And so something, you know, how the timing of all this stuff gets thrown off. And of course, all of you guys have seen kids, four, three and four, five-year-olds with severe language disorders. They may not be able to speak. You may not be able to understand them. They may not be able to understand what you're saying. Uh, and a lot of these kids are aggressive, easily frustrated. Some of them have motor abnormalities. Uh, but they all tend to want to relate to you. They will find some way of communicating, somehow. Well, it's the same problem in people with autism. There may not be that urge to communicate. It has to be trained. And again, the earlier the intervention in some of these processes, the better you get. Uh, and it's not stuttering. Because one of the things we run into in North Carolina is we send somebody to speech therapy. Well, they speak okay, but they can't understand. They're not processing. They're not processing the language. They're just speaking. And they're connected. And if you, so if you, in speaking, in verbal fluency, in fluency processing sound, also correlate with reading. And so that they're interconnected. But we get people who can read but not comprehend. They're very good at decoding words in that process, and that's a, a, a instrumental process. They trained procedural memory. It's how you, how you take a sentence apart.